So tell us all of this trade uncertainty, this unrest in Hong Kong. How is that affecting venture capital when it comes to these investments in, say, Chinese tech startups? So I think the investments in Chinese tech, by the way, thank you for having me here this morning. Um, the investments in Chinese tech startups um, have been affected but it's largely to due to sentiment. Um, the reality is also you're at the end of a very big cycle in China. So the consumer internet companies, that cycle is starting to end. The sharing economy cycle is ending. And you're ramping up more of an enterprise technology focused sector. So there's a natural slowdown that would be occurring anyway. I think where you really see the impact of some of the uncertainty is on the fundraising. So fundraising for dollar based funds in China is down 75% year over year. And I think that that's partly sentiment and, again, partly sensitive to the technology cycles we're in. Especially when you have the U.S. coming in with some blocking of these tech companies, not only Huawei, but also these AI companies and so forth. What's the sentiment like? Do people want to touch these companies when they know that the risk is there, that the U.S. will really block them from the world? Well, you're talking about the companies that are on the entities list, and Huawei and some of them are quite large. If you really look at the startups that are affected, you're talking about tenths of a percent of the startup in, the startup ecosystem in China. So I don't think entrepreneurs or VCs are particularly concerned about that when we're making those initial investments at this time. How important then, I suppose, is the ability to scale internationally? Or is China a big enough market that when you're looking at these companies, even if it is just a domestic play, it's still enticing enough? So what's interesting is if you look at Alibaba, 90 yeah. plus percent of its revenue is in China, and it's a half a trillion dollar company. Tencent, 90 plus percent of its revenue is in China and Southeast Asia, and it's a $400 billion company. So clearly within China, you can build companies that are at significant scale. So I don't think it's a question of whether you can, whether you can build the companies. I think it's going to be, you're going to start to see companies like Musical.ly slash TikTok start to expand overseas and be more successful overseas. And I think that that's a new phase of the Chinese technology companies moving outside of China. And they're pretty large in China, but so the Chinese market allows them to get to critical mass. The U.S. market used to be the only market where you could get to critical mass. If you're the largest in the U.S., you were the largest in the world. That's no longer true. What about Southeast Asia, though? Well, Southeast Asia, let's see, I think Vietnam is half the size of Sichuan province. And so you really have to put Southeast Asia together. And if you put it together, you have a market that is maybe 20% of China in terms of total capacity and opportunity. It's take up when it comes to tech, right? Well, it is because it's coming from such a low base. And they have two roadmaps. They have the U.S. development roadmap, and now they have the Chinese development roadmap. And both of those act as very nice primers for the people that are doing technology development in Southeast Asia. Which is more enticing for these emerging markets? Because now you see the U.S. trying to blacklist all of these Chinese tech, the Chinese tech expansion. But at the same time, there's a reason that these consumers are abroad buy Chinese tech. It's cheaper, right? It's more competitive. So let's distinguish what the U.S. is attacking. So first, you have a political system in the U.S. that for the first time you have a zero-sum game president. The U.S. has never had this before. So you have a low-trust administration in the U.S. interacting with a generally low-trust system in China. When that happens generally, historically, that doesn't end well. So you have to separate that from the U.S. trying to, when you say, block all Chinese technology. That's not the case mm -hmm. at all. And I think the capital flows from endowments, foundations, and those institutions into China are still very substantial. And the majority of risk capital in the last 20 years, over 80% of it has come from the United States. And so foreign capital remains the primary provider of early stage risk capital in China. Should the massive amount of investment that China is putting into things like AI be seen as a threat? No. And this is, this is my greatest frustration, which is when you have a system where people don't trust each other, and clearly right now U.S.-China relations are at that point, you need to start to establish places where you can rebuild that trust. So let's combine resources on cancer research. Let's combine resources on what are the rules for AI, what are the rules for gene editing. There's a whole series of really significant problems the world needs to cooperate on. 82% of the world's venture capital is invested in the U.S. and China. 95% of all private companies over a billion dollars are in the U.S. and China. These two countries have to come together to establish the rules of the game, if you will, globally. And I think the tech companies, the healthcare industry, I think the individuals involved in that that we talked to, the entrepreneurs and the senior players, they want to do that. Right now we have a political system that's making it more difficult.
Uh, here you'll be today uh, speaking about on, on a panel talking about the global cryptocurrencies and we know Mark Zuckerberg making a point that if something like, if a company like Facebook doesn't do it, if the US doesn't do it, then China is going to do it. Is it time for a global digital currency and is that really a new frontier where we see the war between the two superpowers? So I think that on the cryptocurrencies, China, because it has a closed capital account, is not going to allow a cryptocurrency to suddenly become, to suddenly allow it to open its capital account. No. So China will have its own rules on cryptocurrency. I think you have to distinguish that from whether or not we should have a global uh, policy or a global cryptocurrency exchange that would allow Chinese cryptocurrencies to exchange with Bitcoin, whatever the U.S. comes up with, Libra, et cetera. So I think there's two steps that are going to have to occur in this. You're never going to get agreement at this point in time mm -hmm. for China to say, yes, we'll have an open standard that Chinese citizens can freely exchange cryptocurrency with the rest of the world. That's that's inconsistent with their capital with their right. capital account policy on the uh, RMB. Libra has so much opposition right now. Is it just spurring every other country out there to make their own government cryptocurrency now? I think what it's I think it's good in the sense that it's causing people to think about this. Hmm. So I would I would posit that historically governments have been trailing indicators when it came to technology setting aside the NASA space program and, and, and uh, you know things like that, generally policy follows technology as it's gone into the marketplace. This is one that I think is important enough that the policy is actually proceeding apace with the technology development. That is a good thing. So I think it was a wake-up call and the fact that we could have large private exchanges and causing people to think, is that the best path?